Kepler worked with a kind of passionate intensity to understand Tycho's observations. What real motions of the Earth and Mars about the Sun could explain to the precision of measurement the apparent motion as seen from the Earth of Mars in the sky. And why Mars? Because Tycho had told Kepler that the apparent motion of Mars was the most difficult to reconcile with a circular orbit. After years of calculation, he believed that he had found the correct values for a Martian circular orbit, which matched 10 of Tycho Brahe's observations within two minutes of arc. But Kepler's ecstasy of discovery soon crumbled into gloom because two further observations by Tycho were inconsistent with his orbit by as much as eight minutes of arc. Kepler wrote, if I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore them, those eight minutes pointed the road to a complete reformation of astronomy. The difference between a circular orbit and the true orbit of Mars could be distinguished only by precise measurement and by a courageous acceptance of the facts. Kepler was profoundly annoyed at having to abandon a circular orbit. It shook his faith in God as the maker of a perfect celestial geometry. And months later, in some desperation, tried the formula for the first time for an ellipse. The ellipse matched the observations of Tycho beautifully. In such an orbit, the sun is not at the center but is offset. It's at one focus of the ellipse. When a given planet is at the far point in its orbit from the sun, it goes more slowly. As it approaches the near point, it speeds up. Such motion is why we describe the planets as forever falling towards the sun, but never reaching it. Kepler's first law of planetary motion is simply this. A planet moves in an ellipse with the sun at one focus. As the planet moves along its orbit, it sweeps out in a given period of time an imaginary wedge-shaped area. When the planet is far from the sun, the area is long and thin. When the planet is close to the sun, the area is short and squat. Although the shapes of these wedges are different, Kepler found that their areas are exactly the same. This provided a precise mathematical description of how a planet changes its speed in relation to its distance from the sun. Now, for the first time, astronomers could predict exactly where a planet would be in accordance with a simple and invariable law. Kepler's second law is this. A planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. It's not as easy to grasp as circular motion. We might have a tendency to dismiss it, to say it's a mere mathematical tinkering, something removed from everyday life. But these are the laws our planet itself obeys as we, glued by gravity to the surface of the Earth, hurtle through space. We move in accord with laws of nature, which Kepler first discovered. The man who sought harmony in the cosmos was fated to live at a time of exceptional discord on Earth. Exactly eight days after Kepler's discovery of his third law, there occurred in Prague an incident that unleashed the devastating Thirty Years' War. The war's convulsions shattered the lives of millions of people. Kepler lost his wife and young son to an epidemic spread by the soldiery. His royal patron was deposed and he was excommunicated from the Lutheran Church for his uncompromising independence on questions of belief. He was a refugee once again. The conflict, portrayed on both sides as a holy war, was more an exploitation of religious bigotry by those hungry for land and power. This war introduced organized pillage to keep armies in the field.
brutalized population of Europe stood by helpless as their plowshares and pruning hooks were literally beaten into swords and spears. Rumor and paranoia swept through the countryside, enveloping especially the powerless. Among the many scapegoats chosen were elderly women living alone who were charged with witchcraft. Kepler's mother was taken away in the middle of the night in a laundry chest. It took Kepler six years of unremitting effort to save her life. In Kepler's little hometown, about three women were arrested, tortured, and killed as witches every year between 1615 and 1629. And Katerina Kepler was a cantankerous old woman. She engaged in disputes which annoyed the local nobility, and she sold drugs. Poor Kepler thought that he himself had contributed inadvertently to his mother's arrest. It came about because he had written one of the first works of science fiction. It was intended to explain and popularize science and was called the Somnium, the Dream. imagined a journey to the moon with the space travelers standing on the lunar surface, looking up to see, rotating slowly above them, the lovely planet Griff. Part of the basis for the charge of witchcraft was that in his dream, Kepler used his mother's spells to leave the earth. But he really believed that one day human beings would launch celestial ships with sails adapted to the breezes of heaven, filled with explorers who, he said, would not fear the vastness of space. He speculated on the mountains, valleys, craters, climate, and possible inhabitants of the moon. Before Kepler, astronomy had little connection with physical reality. But with Kepler, came the idea that a physical force moves the planets in their orbits. He was the first to combine a bold imagination with precise measurements to step out into the cosmos. It changed everything. This fusion of facts with dreams opened the way to the stars. As a boy, Kepler had been captured by a vision of cosmic splendor, a harmony of the worlds, which he sought so tirelessly all his life. Harmony in this world eluded him. His three laws of planetary motion represent, we now know, a real harmony of the worlds. But to Kepler, they were only incidental to his quest for a cosmic system based on the perfect solids, a system which, it turns out, existed only in his mind. Yet, from his work, we have found that scientific laws pervade all of nature, that the same rules apply on Earth as in the skies, that we can find a resonance, a harmony, between the way we think and the way the world works. When he found that his long-cherished beliefs did not agree with the most precise observations, he accepted the uncomfortable facts. He preferred the hard truth to his dearest illusions. That is the heart of science. <laughs> 